Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to um, welcome you to today's uh, online discussion. Uh, today, we're going to be talking with Megan and Jason. Um, Heritage Ohio's mission is to help people save the places that matter, build community, and live better. Today, we're going to have a presentation on why business owners are not excited about signage. Uh, we'll be taking questions throughout and at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, please type it into the chat box. Um, those questions then will be read to our presenters. Um, tomorrow, we will upload the recording of this session to our YouTube channel. If you search Heritage Ohio on YouTube, you can locate this and other recorded sessions. Our presenters today are Megan and Jason, owners of Innovative Marketing Products. And with that, I'm gonna hand this over to Megan and Jason. Thank you. Thank you and um, thank you for having us here to um, talk, a little, uh, talk about signs with you today. I know it's not very exciting to talk about signage, but here we are. So um, again, thank you for having us. Um, Jason and I have our company, Innovative Marketing Products, and we've been together for about four years. And Jason's been doing this almost all his life. So he's, he's a pro. Um, so Jason, would you like to add anything here at this moment? Um, just the fact that, um, you know, what we're going to be talking about um, is primarily the signage and the importance of such. Uh, these are pretty much one of the last things that are thought of uh, when it comes to, um, you know, business thoughts. But in all actuality, it's pretty much one of the most important things that you really need to consider and, and think a lot about um, when you're getting into this process. Okay, thanks, Jason. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so if, if you are not muted, can you let me know if you can see the Facebook page? If anybody is not muted, just say yes or no. Thumbs yes. Up. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, so um, Jason and I are just gonna go through our Facebook page. I wanna apologize. We just did not have time to get a presentation together before today um, with everything, everybody's crazy. So we're gonna use our Facebook page, which is a great way to reach out to us if you do need a sign is through our Facebook. So Jason and I have a router, a CNC router that we use to make a lot of our signage. Um, and when we do that, we buy, um, our materials and then we just get to work with the router and then also sometimes we will make graphics to do this. So here are some signs. Um, this is actually a sign that we refurbished down in Vermilion for the park and this here's another example of things that we would do and these are great. These are an apartment complex um, uh, we were just we were able to simply um, upgrade the look of this apartment by changing out their old numbers they had here and using these um, plexiglass. These are also engraved, and it really did. It made just like a huge difference of the look of the buildings. Um, and of course, these are our other products that we offer: vehicle graphics on a car. We do a lot of that kind of stuff. And window clings, we still do offer window clings, but um, that would be like the minimum vinyl graphic um, product that we now offer. I don't know if you were, had time to read, but we are getting away from a lot of the personalized stuff that we do. Um, here's another engraved sign, letting everybody know your office hours. It keeps, it's just, you know, this, this, is, a, this is a great example of a good sign um, in our opinion, because it, It'll last forever. It's the material that we use. It has the leasing offer office hours on there. Um, and it, it just looks really nice compared to what was there. Um, hopefully your hours don't change. That would be the only bad thing of making it so permanent. But um, this is a whole apartment complex that we did. All they're just switched out. And I thought I had some before and afters here, but I don't. So, yeah, there were several uh, building signs. There was 87, I think, address plaques. And then so, we also had uh, fabricated their custom illuminated sign cabinet out in front. Yeah. So that was a pretty big job. 
Yeah. That was so a good here's, one. An, here's another sign. Sorry, Jason, I mean to cut you off. Okay. Nope. So here's another sign um, also in Vermilion. Um, this is a great example of another, um, of why a sign is important. So this sign really does give you a visualization of what they do. There's the popping, the popcorn, it's called popping around, and it, it communicates um, with your customer. And it, I think it also does, a, it's, it's an inviting sign. So, um, you know, just talking about the importance of signs. I mean, we, we know business owners do not get excited about signs. They, they are always the last thing anybody thinks about. Um, and, and they can be expensive. So, and you know, it's just kind of something you just don't put a lot of thought into. So Jason and I do that. We put a lot of thought into designing a sign to make it a visual, you know, something to talk about, you know, get people in, increase your sales. I mean, that really is the important part of a good sign and you want it to communicate um, with your customers. So um, we, we really like this sign and um, this was a kind of a little, uh, work of art with um, how we went about doing that. But again, that's. So Megan, um, do you do the design work or do owners uh, typically give you artwork? We typically do the artwork. Um, every now and then we, we may get a logo or something like that. But for the most part, no, we do it. We do the design. I, I think Jason, wouldn't you say we pretty much designed all of our signs except for a couple logos that we've been given? Yeah, generally, we even design around the look of the logo, uh, the color scheme, the style, and then we create uh, a design of the whole uh, the whole sign based around that kind of look or that genre. And that so, is really one of the most important parts of making a sign is making sure those colors and logos are all coming together. That's fairly important. Um, so here we, this was an interesting project that we are able to do. And this is something that we may take um, on as a, as a job if you really needed to, but we got into doing some housing restorations last year. Um, we made these corbels um, for a, a historic home. And that was, a, that, was, that was an interesting project. Here's the, uh, on the left is the old one. Um, they were wood and we were able to um, remake those, refabricate the exact same thing, just using a different material that'll last longer. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if we have any of the photos of them on the building, on the, on the house. Yeah, I don't think we do. Um, so here's our spray booth, Jason, doing What's his that? spray thing. So does somebody have a question? Oh, I guess not. Okay, um, so here's another sign. Um, this would be an inexpensive sign. And of course, we got the colors here to really grab you. Um, it's car wash. So we tried to make that as inviting as possible. So that's why we added some of the, the water in the back because everybody likes to look at water or we think so. Um, and yeah, so this, this, this is a, a cheaper alternative to a sign. This is just a cabinet and um, these are graphics except for the main street, those are routed and we apply those to the sign. So this was all Jason. Jason did this design. He did a really good job on that. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> the, the text car wash and the two uh, blade street signs are actually cut out of half inch PVC, painted and then applied. So the graphic itself is flat, but it, the, the text and the, the street signs just give it that extra dimension. It gives you that extra cast shadow and it makes it pop just that much more to really grab your attention. Extra price for the two metal stakes. I'm sorry? I'm kidding you. Extra price for those two metal stakes to the right of your picture which you need to crop out most likely or would like to crop out go back to the previous picture look to the right you've got two metal stakes in your picture oh there yeah, yeah that was just from the install <laughs> yeah they were they were actually we're putting in some electrical for some surface lighting for that sign so we weren't able to take those out at that time but that's a good idea well they should be gone by now i can go back up there and get a <laughs> Yeah. Get a nice picture with some grass and without the dirt and the stakes on the ground. 
we're horrible at getting photos. We were really bad at that. We sort of <laughs> install signs and then take photos and we're like, okay, we're good. But our, our families really get on us for this. Okay, so here is another sign um, that we did. If you look at the bottom of the sign, this is, we fabricate this all in house. So this is like a faux base. It's becoming really popular. It's, it's a lot less inexpensive to alternatives. And it's something that we can kind of assemble in the shop and then take it to the site and then um, just put it in. So it makes a really easy install. And this is a great sign. Um, if you see here, since we're talking about electrical, this we actually removed um, and we changed the lighting um, to an internally lit sign. And it just creates a beautiful glow. The sign is gorgeous. Um, but we do have to get some extra permits for this. This was in Westlake. Um, so we actually kind of led the way in Westlake to get rid of ground lighting. And they're now going to let do people do internal lighting without jumping through so many hoops that we had to. Um, but. So we have one question, Megan. Any problems with the local officials on zoning um, or other regulations? Sure, all the time and we just take care of it. So like for this sign, we had to go around and get signatures from the residents stating they would be fine with, a, with an internally lit sign as opposed to a ground sign. Even though it's much you know, psychologically easier on you to have an internally lit halo glow than a ground sign that's just one bright light, but we still had to go around and get those signatures, take them to the business, to the um, development place and, and ha you know, sit through a hearing to get them approved. But we did. Uh, the cities and the townships and the districts, they do have their regulations and their rules. Um, we abide by all of those rules. We're very uh, strict we about that. We don't make any shortcuts. And sometimes they do request us to do additional things. And I mean, that's just, that's just, part, of the, that's just part of the business. So, I mean, we work with the, with the cities and the, even some of the review boards um, just to be sure that, you know, what they're approving is what's getting put up and that everybody is everybody is happy both the customer as well as the city or the the review board last thing we want to do is is upset the people that allow us to put the signs up because then they start thinking twice about when we want to come back and do another one it, it really is just we follow all the protocols because if we don't they could come and tell us after all this work to come take the, the sign down you know and then we have a lot of upset people so we we um that's usually just something we handle it's 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 a lot of extra work and um it just gets handled we just kind of learn as we go how to go about things more efficiently um so here's another sign this was another interesting sign we just ha didn't have a lot of room so jason that's why he kind of built this off of the other sign because then that's another thing we have to always work around as square footage what you're allowed for a sign. So we have to get kind of creative in how we can how we can get a sign in. And this was just a really odd place. This is also in Westlake down Detroit. Um, it was just it just wasn't a great place to put a sign, but it was it was the option that would get the the this pause and effect the best visibility because nobody can find his location is so far back off the road. So um, and then we do banners. Um, these all went to the Lowe's stores when they coronavirus hit and they were trying to, they were in crisis mode, um, making a bunch of signs to direct traffic. So we delivered those all over the state of Ohio. Um, more vehicle graphics. You know, vehicle graphics are just a really, I mean, if you have a business and you have vehicles that you use for your business, um, and just to answer any questions about that, if you don't already, yes, it, it does make a difference with insurance when you do put those on. But um, this is a, I mean, it's just great to advertise. It, and it, yeah, it, it does more than pay for itself. You're pretty much just creating a mobile uh, billboard and you're being seen by thousands and thousands of potential customers every single time you go out. And we just, you know, with those, just get your, you know, you can do the bare minimum with graphics. You just need your logo and a phone number, not a website, just a phone number. Um, the most minimal, you know, type of information as possible. Does anybody have any questions? Well, there's one thing that I, I'd like to, I'd like to make clear that, you know, when you're, 
when you're talking about designing a sign or, or us providing you a sign, the logo is a good idea. Um, but the, the, the most important thing is your product or service. So that's why the, the car wash sign, the name of the car wash was, was smaller, but car wash was just, it was prominent. You really need to let the, let the, the surrounding people know what it is that you do. That's the most important thing. And then obviously contact information, whether it's a phone number um, or an email. And as Megan said, the websites, they're, they're just becoming a little bit more obsolete. I mean, I myself would much rather make a phone call and talk to somebody than try to go through a website and things like that. If they're interested in some of your, um, your products or your service, then you can guide them to the website. But an initial really, yeah. contact is what you're really looking for. And then you're at, what it is that you're, that you're providing. So, and um, another um, type of signage that, that seems to be amazing for business owners are your channel letters. Those really just are just, I mean, I, I think I put this in our description on our Facebook page. They're just, they're simply just so easy to grab a lot of attention. They look clean and nice and um, they just, the visualization that they provide is, is comforting, you know, it, it makes you want to go into a business. And that's really what your aim is with a good sign. Your aim is just to be simple, clean, and get people in, communicate what you want to. So that's so why Megan, it's exciting. <laughs> Megan, do you have any examples of signs you've created for historic district businesses? We, Jason, do we have any, um, from previous years. Um, here's some that we did in historic area in Vermilion, um, just trying to flow there, downtown Vermilion. Um, yeah, there are, there's, we have, a, a, I mean, that's, that's a good example of one that it's, the historic areas have much more strict regulations. Um, yeah, that's a good one for the, the so Wellington. We did the we, Wellington. We yeah, we refurbished their uh, cast cast iron um, historic legion signs, and those turned out really nice. But yeah, when it comes to historic areas, they do have a lot more um, strict rules and regulations, which we do follow. They seem to have a much more uh, narrowed color scheme. Yeah. So we, we stuck along with that. I mean, and anything that that, that, that's specific or specialized, we, we, we accommodate as much as we can, to, again, to make everybody happy. It's very restricted in, in those areas. So do you have any thoughts or um, experience dealing with um, blade signs or protruding signs and uh, how those work with walkability? I'm going to let Jason answer that because, yep, absolutely. Yeah, um, the popping around sign is actually a projecting sign or a blade sign that comes off the building. Um, in most locations, the projecting signs are over top of sidewalks. So you have a minimum distance between where the bottom of the sign can be to the sidewalk, which is typically nine feet. Sometimes it varies between eight to nine feet, but I'd like to more than likely stay above or at nine feet. Um, and then they, uh, I, well, Vermillion, they can't be any farther out projecting from the building, I think more than 26 inches. So we create the sign to get right up against that area or even a few inches inside that area to make sure that we're not even a quarter of an inch past what they're, what they're allowed. They're typically put up with aluminum or uh, steel brackets They've gone away from doing the cable suspension assistance, just simply because those things, the cable will start to rust, um, they'll fray, and we don't want a lot of different mounting points to help to try to, to suspend the, the weight of the sign. We've also gone to um, a material called high density urethane or HDU as opposed to the old cedar uh, wood it's much lighter in weight. Uh, it lasts a, a lot longer than the wood would. And so the weight alone is a huge benefit. You don't have to have as much anchor points 
or you don't have to have a match plate on the inside or interior of the wall to help assist with the, the that weight because they're they're very light as they are. And then some of the blade signs or projecting signs, they you can illuminate those. Those are usually illuminated with a, a gooseneck type lighting style where the light would come out or project out from the bracket itself and then gooseneck back and then down light onto the sign face itself. Which right here, the spread and boo sign, that's what we wanted to do here. We wanted to get the goosenecks up here to shine yeah, down on the sign. Gorgeous. Yeah. But they just didn't have, they didn't have the funds for that. And you can see on the bottom of each of the signs, one is that orange color and the other one's that green. They act, those are actual little light boxes. They have fluorescent tube lighting in there. And I don't think those things have worked in years. I still don't think they have them lit. I still don't think they're lit up. Yeah. And there's a few, there's a few buildings, a few uh, storefronts in right here in Wellington that has those lights that they just, they don't use them. And I think that's just a, unfortunately, that's just a waste. They depend on the street lights to light up their signs. And I mean, it's, it's not cheap, but it really makes a huge difference when you've got that whole feature that just really stands out. So have you had any experience uh, working on theater marquees of historical theater, th historic theaters? No, we have not, but that definitely sounds like something that I would love to do. Um, we do have a picture in here somewhere. I saw it when she was going through briefly. My, uh, my younger sister is a music teacher up in Buffalo, and she puts on concerts with her students, and every now and again, she'll, she'll call me up and she'll ask if I'd be interested in, in doing something for like a, a prop for their plays or something like that. So as of right now, I've done two separate things. I've created um, a roll away gondola that she had that she that she used for one of her performances. And I actually created a miniature fame sign that lights up, that's battery operated. You just flip a switch and it turns on. So when she did her little fame performance, it was, it was lit up. Um, I'm just, those, those are the ones that I really enjoy doing. The ones that, you know, thinking outside the box and coming up with different ideas of, of creating. Yeah, there's the fame sign. That lights up. That thing weighs all of eight pounds and it's fully dimensional and lit up with LEDs on the inside. And Jason built that. So he's done a lot of theater props for her show. So he built this boat and then this is just vinyl on here for one of the shows. Yeah, that's actually wood fabric. That's fabric that I got from Joanne Fabrics and I stretched it across the frame of the, of the, wood, the wood boat. Anybody we else? Also, we also did the, um, the Wellington, uh, the black and silver signs. We refurbished those. We should put those things on the Facebook page too. I know we have a picture of them somewhere. Which I don't recall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if we, um... anyone has any questions, uh, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little chat um, icon. You can click on that chat icon and type any questions that you might have into the chat box. Uh, someone says, do you make and or repair neon signs? Neon signs are, they're becoming a lot uh, less popular. Um, but can you do it, Jason? Can you fix a neon sign? It depends on what the problem is. If the glass is broken, then I, I do, I, I cannot fix the neon sign. I would actually have to find a neon vendor. Um, and then obviously we'd have to regas it with either the neon or the argon that goes inside, it creates the color. Um, if it's an electrical issue and it doesn't light up anymore, but the glass is still intact, then odds are it just needs a new power supply. And that's something that we can definitely provide. If it needs a new backer to it, if the backer's broken or cracked or damaged in any way, we can definitely do that and then re retie the neon to the backer. Um, but again, if the glass is broken and the gas is out, then I would actually have to um, find a neon vendor to, to repair that. So if you do have one that needs repaired, I'll have to take a look at it. And then if it's broken, I should be able to find a neon guy. I know a couple of them that 
you know, used to do it. There is somebody that specializes in neon signs in Illyria. Yeah, they still fabricate. They still make them. It's just they're they're becoming, it's almost like a lost art. Yeah, that's, that's definitely find, not our niche. Yeah, and you can't find a neon vendor around every street corner. They're, they're becoming far and few in between anymore, which is unfortunate. Yes. And you can't have those in historic uh, areas. Absolutely. <laughs> no neon signs in the historic areas. So someone asked if you had any examples of uh, any financial incentive programs to spur businesses uh, to do more creative signs in historic downtown. Can you say that again? Have you heard of or worked with any communities that, that yes. might be offering um, financial incentives to do signage? Yeah, and Jenny Arts might, um, also be able to help with that. But yes, we do. Um, actually, right now we're working with a handful of people that got funding through their city um, to, to get their businesses signed. So the city wrote the, the grants, wrote for the grants, and they were awarded them and they got the money to use. So yes, yep, absolutely. We have, I think, two or three jobs right now that we're, that we're using money that they got grant from grants. And a lot of times those grants are, um, they're presented as a would you call it like a facelift or a um it's a renovation downtown i don't know yeah, if it's like, a, yeah, it's like a renovation so what they're doing is they're providing um a monetary amount for the business to kind of like redress their facade their their storefront um and it includes you know paint uh, possibly awnings and signage is definitely one of the one of the parts included in that grant jason was the vermilion sign included in that the, the, um, ones, the the marina sign was that part of the current ones yes okay. they have they currently have a grant out the i'm not sure if the marina sign is one but the um it, the yeah. anchor yeah. the anchor that blade sign those two blade signs that we're waiting on approval for those yeah. are a part of of the grant that they're doing yeah. up there yes Well, I'm not seeing any additional questions. Um, okay. Anything else that you all could share with us about uh, maybe the importance of signage and at what point in opening a new business you would suggest um, someone put up their exterior signs? It feels like often that's, that's the very last thought. Yeah, it, I would you definitely, definitely want to get your your sign into it, it should be I mean as soon as you're developing your business plans it should be in your business plan because you know that's a lot of um it, it's marketing dollars for one and two you want it to flow you don't want to do I mean Jason and I do a pretty good job I think of you know coming in and trying to um connect those dots but it's great because there's a lot of different things you can do with signage and unfortunately um, what's really going to become very popular, which Jason and I are headed in this direction, is, you know, all your digital signs. Those are going to be taking over, and then that's going to be more to compete with when you have a sign. So your neighbor has a beautiful digital sign flashing all sorts of messages. You're going to need an even better sign because that's all they're going to see is the one that grabs their attention. So we focus on what's headed, you know, our future. So we read a lot and go to you know, these meetings and things, and they're saying, you know, especially with, you know, the generations um, that are coming up, you're only going to have two or three seconds to get their attention, if that, and, you know, they're not really, you know, they're going to, they're going to be the ones that want signs to just basically, you know, jump out at them. So it, it's really important to get this in, you know, your business plan up front, because it, and, you know, it's so easy um, to get, you know, cause like I said, I'm like, I hate to say this, but it's like, nobody really loves the idea of a sign. Nobody wakes up and says, honey, let's get this sign planned for today. We really, you know, it's just not something people plan for. So it's, it's, it's great to get that in your, in your business plan. So Megan and Jason, what are, what's your turnaround time on a typical sign? Well, it, it can take, you know, a couple of weeks or so, depending. So we are custom. Everything we do is, I mean, we make in the shop. We really 
have to put a lot of thought into your design. So, I mean, just even getting the design done, coming out, we'll do our site survey. We'll, you know, speak with you about your colors and designs and everything that you, you know, want to do. So then we develop that, the visual, and then we send that. And that usually takes about a week to get um, you, you know, once we send it off, you get to make alterations and things like that. If you don't like something, we usually do three or four different types of designs to send. So that could take a week, just the creative process. And then once we get started, it just all depends on what kind of sign you have. Um, it could take two weeks, three weeks. Sometimes it could take four weeks. <laughs> so yeah, yeah it, like like she, it's, it really all depends on the on the sign style, the sign type that you have. Um, obviously, the carved signs um, we hand paint. So, you know, we can only do so many layers of colors at one time and then it has to dry. Then we go back and do second and sometimes third coats. And, so, and, that is, and the paint is a factor too, because we sign paint is oil-based and we don't always use an oil-based paint, but it's it, the longevity of an oil-based paint, you know, is, is great. And sometimes the color is better, but um, that does take considerable drying time. If we use a latex paint, then it does dry. It does not take as long to dry. But that oil paint and some of the processes that we do, even when they're dry, have to sit for two days to get all the, what do you call it, Jason? When we let something sit, like you have to let it cure. Let cure. All the, yeah, yeah, you're right. curing. And then also paint also gases out. So you have to let yeah, it gas yeah. out and, yeah. and things like that. If I could briefly just go um, kind of like uh, backtrack a little bit. Um, you had asked about the importance of signage and when is it a good idea to think about it as you know coming up with a new business and things like that um i also wanted to mention that you actually want to try to advertise well before you're even considering opening the doors you want to get you want to get your name or your product out there and kind of get the people that are in the area kind of excited about when you're going to open so a lot of times when it comes to new businesses is Megan had mentioned not only putting the sign, the, the, the sign plan into your business plan, but thinking about ways to promote the business before you even open. Um, I would, you know, we would provide, you know, coming soon banners. Um, you can do uh, sidewalk signs or even just getting something out there that helps promote the business before, you know, before you're even open during construction you can put, you know, something up. Um, you, you want to, you want to be ahead of the game. And unfortunately, when it comes to being ahead of the game, the signage is at the very tail end. The finished piece more than likely will not go up before the business is actually open. It might go up on opening day. It might go up just a few days before, but you've got to get the interest there before you're at that point because you don't want to try to advertise and try to promote and g grab everybody's attention after your doors are open because that's so much time that you could have been, you know, promoting your business and having people actually at the door when you open. So, I mean, I just wanted to make that kind of an important, an important feature is promotion is, is the biggest part of the game. And if you wait, if you wait till the to the opening time or you wait too long, you've wasted and you've lost all that potential promotion time and getting your name and you're getting the interest out there and the excitement out there that you're almost like starting from square one after your doors are already open. Okay, I'm done with my rant. <laughs> great. Those are great points, Jason. Appreciate that. Joe and Joyce noticed uh, two or three last items coming in. Uh, can Jenny comment more about the uh, uh, America's Main Street Prize? And uh, I see Frank Quinn here, some interesting historic and neon sign comments. So I'll, I'll read Frank's uh, comments uh, just to point out that with neon signage, it's been around for more than 100 years. So there are some neon signs that exist today that would be considered historic and allowed in historic downtowns. Um, 
That's and then, good. Good um, uh, he had asked, hi, this is Jenny. Um, yeah. Our America's Main Street, we had won an award last year through Independently Stand, and the prize was $25,000, and we put over half of that in the forms of mini grants for our local community. So it was kind of a one-time thing. Um, and that was just, I was just letting um, everybody know that it's unfortunately not something that the Village of Wellington offers all the time, but we did offer for um, facade renovations and new signage and such. Hopefully that answered your question. Yes, thanks very much, Jenny. Great. Any other questions before we um, sign oh, off a little early? And, and just, Go ahead, Megan. Who was the person, um, I'm sorry, that has a, a neon sign in Historic District? Uh, Frank Quinn is our, his, is our preservation, our director of preservation at Heritage okay. Ohio. Okay. And, and so he, he works with a lot of uh, local design review boards and, yes. um, you know, just clarified that some, some downtowns do allow. Yeah. yeah, that's great. I would love to know um, where and just to kind of look into the regulation, like what you would have to do to get it, you know, approved. Well, well hey, and go ahead, Frank. Oh, I'm sorry. So, so this is Frank, and I'm thinking like even in Wellington, downtown Wellington. Yeah. There's the signage for forts. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was a formerly <laughs> right functioning neon sign, and so my my guess is that within Wellington's design review district that they would want to, you know, if the building owner came forward with a proposal to relight that neon sign using the uh, traditional materials that uh, Wellington would want to, that their board would want to see that happen. That's great. So, that, that is great. Cause we have definitely, from our experience, it's been a no. Oh, yeah. I do know well, too with, Sorry, with Fort Sign, um, yeah, the Mason Sign is really cool, what Rich just mentioned. Um, but anyways, the Fort Sign is one of the few blades in our town, and I know that they were grandfathered in, yeah. that yeah. still in Wellington, unfortunately, it's against zones, zoning to have a blade sign. So anytime they need to work on Fort sign, they have to do it in place because if they remove it to repair it, they can't put it back up. So I wish that we could somehow work with the village and get that zoning changed. But right. so far, it's, it's been a little bit of a brick wall. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that speaks to a larger advocacy role that um, the Main Street there in Wellington, you just need to keep chipping away at them. I remember years ago when I was doing Main Street, um, we had the same issue with the signage. And it was, it was just a matter of the design committee continuing to work with the city government, providing examples of vibrant blade signage from other communities and saying, why can't, why can't we do this here? Really trying to gather what is holding back the and a lot of times uh, city. A lot of times it seems like it's just the old the old zoning rules were the way they were. Sometimes, like you said, you just got to keep chipping away to get them to yep. just get the crack open the book and rewrite it. Yeah, yeah. When yeah exactly. When we were approached um, with one of the businesses down here in Wellington, uh, they had actually requested a blade sign, and I went to the city and and discussed with um, with the individual there. And I had made it a point to, you know, point out both the fort sign and the uh, the mason signs, uh, both being blade signs. And there used to be, and you can see on a lot of the buildings down here, there used to be a lot more of those blade signs because you can see the mounting points and the and the existing structure. And she had mentioned to me that one, the fort sign is grandfathered in, and any jobs, any work that's done is an in place position. Um, so if anything is removed, then it's no longer grandfather, that's null and void, and they're, you know, they're, they're out of sign. Um, her main concern, and I think is what 
the excuse is, is that the building structures themselves, they're not sure that it's strong enough to be able to, to maintain the weight of a new blade sign. Um, the mortars withering away, the bricks are, are starting to deteriorate a little bit. And that was one of what she had said, what one of the main concerns was. But nowadays the blade signs weigh half, if not a quarter of what the traditional blade signs were to weigh. I mean, the, the fort sign alone is, is a steel frame with a, a metal skin and then the, the neon on top of that. And the power supply just for the neon can weigh up to 20 pounds. Mm -hmm. But you know, the, the HDU that we use nowadays, even with the thin wall aluminum, we can get that weight down considerably. So I think that, I think the chipping away is, is definitely something that I'd be interested in doing because putting blade signs back do down there in Wellington, it, it's going to bring things back the way, you know, it's the historic look, it's but cool. with a, exactly. more bring of a modern it style, a more updated. And I think that that would be fantastic in Wellington. Great conversational I, pieces to get people downtown for sure. Yeah, yeah and, and just a real quick thing. We had um, someone from our design review board just resign about two days ago. So Jason, oh. you are a, a <laughs> resident of Wellington. If you would like to, to join, um, let me know. And actually both of you are welcome to be on the design committee and help us work on this. So okay, I'm out. Kind of big this, you're saying? Possibly, <laughs> you can help us work on it. Yeah. Is there an application I need to fill out? <laughs> oh no, 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 no. Well, no, not really. I think we can do it. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Neon lights are I think back. <laughs> I think one other thing that you need to do is to challenge those assumptions. Uh, if there is good math behind someone asserting that these building facades can't take the, the weight of a blade sign, then that's one thing. But my guess is that, you know, someone said that in a meeting uh, mm -hmm. because they looked at it once and there, there's no physical evidence to back that up. Um, from the issue of building repair and maintenance, that, that's a different topic that Main Streets, again, have to uh, use their advocacy uh, platform to continue to fight for. And then lastly, when design review boards are trying to capture an appearance of an era that um, you know was was from the 1950s or before, I, I don't think there's probably any city that has a 1950s streetscape that didn't show that downtown having projecting signage. Mm -hmm. And that that was one of the things that that we used is that you know, if you want to, if you want to preserve a historic look and feel, then allow what was allowed back then. Yeah, yeah, allow a prominent feature that was very popular back then and bring that back. Really so, capture that that era. Frank, um, while we do a little quick um, wrap up, I'm wondering if you, if you're on your computer, if you have a good example of a historic blade sign or a historic downtown and you could share your screen with us that would be terrific I just made you a co-host so you could do that if you have something handy that's great if not that's okay too um, yeah unfortunately I'm on my iPad right now oh okay uh, somebody had asked can you show an example of a blade sign really if you just go to your Google uh, search and search historic uh, downtowns <laughs> uh, you will see dozens and dozens of blade signs. A blade sign is a sign that protrudes um, from the building. It is more pedestrian friendly. Um, they, they were prolific in our historic downtowns. I'm still totally befuddled by the restrictions on signs in a lot of our historic districts. Um, signage is something that absolutely does not deteriorate our historic nature in any way. Um, there's no reason to not be creative when it comes to signage. So the limitations on, on signage is something that, that's a little frustrating in the realm that we work. Um, mm -hmm. I also did hear from Amy from Tiffin, who says that they have his, some historic neon signs in their downtowns. New ones are not allowed, but they're allowed to refurbish uh, ones that were there and in existence. And then we heard the same thing from Cuyahoga Falls. 
So if you're looking for a few communities that are yes. making allowances for these kinds of signs, um, the re they're, they're, they're doing they're the, refurbish there. the refurbishment or yeah. Yeah. And uh, just and from a, a vibrant, go ahead. Frank. I'm sorry. Just, I was just going to say from a vibrant signage standpoint, Tom in Cleveland, um, has always been willing to share information about the signage that they do. They may have a signage program which provides a bit of funding, their signage ordinance. In all ways, Cleveland is doing it right with the signage in their uh, historic districts. It's good to hear. Absolutely. And uh, Joyce just put into the message board too that we can share some examples of good design standards for historic downtowns. So if you are in a super restrictive um, historic district uh, that's kind of limiting your creativity, especially when it comes to signage, reach out to us. Uh, we can send you, um, you know, guidelines that are already written that maybe you can rip off and tweak and duplicate for your own community uh, usage. I'm a huge proponent for creative signs. I think it's super important. So um, uh, you can find our contact information at heritageohio.org. Uh, email address is there for Frank, for myself, uh, Francis, and for Joyce Barrett as well. So feel free to send a quick email to any of us if you want. Uh, and it, some examples of less restrictive and more uh, beneficial sign uh, guidelines. And it really is so valuable to have that because when you have people that can kind of offer you, a, you know, kind of, you don't have to take the whole idea, but if there are areas, especially with the neon signage that everybody seems really interested in, if there are places around, I just haven't seen it, that are allowing you that, definitely definitely take the time to check out what everybody's doing because it is, it is, it will create, it will, I mean, no matter, any sign shop you go to, if you go through them with an idea of what you're looking for, like even if it's just a picture, it, it is going to help you get more of what you want instead of just kind of having it in your head and describing it. So if you go to Cleveland and you have a photo, you take a photo of something you really like and you go into a sign shop, I mean, it's really going to help you ensure that you get what you want. Thank you, Megan. Else? Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions? If so, you can type those quickly into the uh, chat box. And um, you're looking right now at Megan and Jason's Facebook page for their uh, business innovative marketing products. Um, this will be a recorded session and we can share that on our YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and search Heritage Ohio, you'll see this recording along with um, others that have been uploaded previously. Feel free to watch those and share those at will. Um, all I have left is uh, Medina wanted to make sure to point out that they do allow small projecting signs, um, but their maximum is four square feet, um, but in an effort to make things a little more pedestrian friendly. So, well, Megan, Jason, thank you so much for sharing with us today. I appreciate your time. And Jenny, thanks so much for um, arranging this. Uh, Sadly, we were not be able to be in person in Wellington for our design training over the last few days. So I'm super happy that we were able to kind of tap into Wellington a little bit. Um, thanks so much and uh, appreciate everyone's time today. Thanks nope. again. Thank you. If Bye. anybody has any questions regarding signage, feel free to contact us anytime. We'll, I mean, whether you go with us or not, we at least want you to have the information and, and whatever details that you might need to move forward. And we're always learning, so please contact us with anything, because if we don't have the answer, we will find it out. And if you're interested in more information from Heritage Ohio, again, go to heritageohio.org. Uh, we also have individual and um, uh, business memberships through Heritage Ohio. It is through those memberships that all of these uh, programs are made possible across the state. So uh, please go to Heritage Ohio's website and take a look at the other cool things that we do. Thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate your time. Have a great you. day. Bye. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.